Okay, guys, we might start. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you that, that are sitting on the ground, if you smell smoke, um, make a dash for the exit, please, otherwise we're going to be in trouble. Um, uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Liam Young. I run um, Inter7 here at the AA and uh, the think tank Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. Um, and it's my pleasure tonight to be hoping, uh, hosting tonight's lecture from Bjarke Engels um, and the UK launch of his uh, practices book, Yes Is More. Uh, after co-founding Plot Architects in 2001 and uh, collaborating with Rem Kulaus and Noah May. Um, and Natasha uh, Sandmeyer. And Natasha <laughs> Sandmeyer. Um, and uh, uh, Biaki started big in 2005. And this publication um, is the first monograph and marks the, uh, the practice's extensive work to date. Um, the evening we'll be beginning with, uh, with a lecture from Biaki, um, uh, but uh, followed by some questions. And then at the back of the room, um, at the end of the evening, we'll be opening up the doors and um, there's some free drinks. Uh, Charlotte from the AA Bookshop will be um, selling copies of the book at a reduced uh, special launch price and um, the chinking of glasses and hopefully the conversation will continue around the corner. Um, so just by way of a brief introduction, um, the book tonight's event is centered around is um, kind of a, an architectural monograph rendered as a cartoon strip with uh, Biaki Engels here cast as the uh, comic superhero as he bounds um, through the bish bash zap pow bubbles of Big's amazingly extensive oeuvre of kinky constructions. Um, uh, dueling with the arch villains of planning regulators, developers, and the gloom of global recession, the costume Bjarki in slogan t-shirts and shiny sneakers, as opposed to the architect's standard dress of black, always seems to win the day. <laughs> Sorry, that was written before yeah, I saw you. <laughs> It's, a, it's, a, it's an architecture school, you know. <laughs> uh, he squeezes humour from bureaucracy and spins tall tales of wide-eyed optimism and pop-tastic pop manifestos of yes, 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 floating between the extremes of radical avant-garde and the jobby architect agenda of the commercial office, he joyfully engages a celebration of opposites, or perhaps the celebration of compromise, the pragmatic utopia, project casts, projects cast as a naughty uh, comic threesome rather than an epic battle outside the pub with the other guy. Um, like superhero stories with their own catchphrases, holy architecture, Batman, up, up and away, to infinity and beyond, Big's work is punctuated by seductive slogans. Bigamy, you can always have both. Uh, evolution, not revolution. A well fairy tale found in translation, the big picture. But maybe at the moment the most radical cry of the contemporary architect is yes. The radicality of yes, not no. Uh, the positivity rather than the negative nihilist response of the grumpy, discontented maverick architect. So Biaki stands atop his constructed mountains with his cape flying in the stiff breeze, shouting out his latest instalment in the line of iconic architecture catch cries. Less is more, less is a bore, less is less, less is only more when more is no good, consume more, more is more, more is a bore, more is a whore, I'm a whore, more or less, yes or less, yes, 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 and for tonight and happily ever after, Yes is more. Uh, please welcome to the AA, Bjarke Engels. Thanks. Um, so I, I think almost everything is, uh, is said by now. But uh, like I'd, I'd like to uh, t tell you uh, uh, a few stories about uh, some of our work. And, um, uh, and, and maybe by, by showing a few examples, show, show this sort of uh, evolution of ideas uh, that, that flows through the office and, uh, and flows through the projects. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, uh, my name is Bjarke Ingels, and, uh, and this is my house, uh, my apartment. <laughs> um, and the view from my apartment uh, overlooking this sort of landscape of, uh, of triangular balconies um, that our client once named the, the Leonardo DiCaprio balcony. Um, and they sort of transformed the south facade of the, of the building into this sort of social space where on a nice summer day you'll actually get to, to meet all the, the young ladies in a 10 meter radius of, of your apartment. Um, they're called the VM houses, because seen from Google Earth they look like a V and an M. And that's essentially because they're a distortion of a square block, sort of um, zigzagging it to sort of avoid looking straight into each other and giving all apartments attractive views of the surrounding landscapes, like a, a suburban carpet on one side and a big park. Um, and um, the general sort of material palette is very sober, sort of Scandinavian materials, glass, wood, uh, aluminum. 
Um, is it possible to dim the light slightly, or is that the? Yeah. Um, but the, for the two main entrances, we were going to have this sort of 80 square meter big uh, wall uh, with just a door in it, and, it, and we thought it was going to be too evil to come home to this sort of sheet of metal and uh, and enter your apartment. So we proposed our client that we could do some kind of building integrated artwork. Uh, but our client said, you know, I'm a I'm a developer. I'm not a gallerist. Uh, aluminum is good. Um, but then I had dinner at the top floor of Arne Jacobsen's uh, Hotel Royale in Copenhagen, and I saw this painting. I asked the waiter uh, who it was, and he said it was a portrait of uh, Alberto Co. Alberto Co is the name of the restaurant, but it, it used to be the name of the director of Hotel Royale when it was being built. Um, and, the, and, the, and the painter was none other than Arne Jacobsen himself. So I like this idea of this sort of great Danish uh, modernist. He was like almost like this sort of Renaissance man that would sort of design Alberto Co's hotel, then paint his portrait, and then hang it in the restaurant named after him. Um, so I told our clients, uh, Per Hüfner and Axel Frederiksen, that it was almost like a Danish modern tradition. Um, <laughs> but you know, s since I'm not a painter, and since our canvas was so much bigger, uh, we ended up buying these uh, standard uh, bathroom tiles, 10 by 10 centimeters, in 10 different colors, and put them up in this nice pattern. Um, <laughs> And you know, so, so suddenly there was money in the budget for, uh, for artwork. I, I think actually sort of by definition we managed to turn ass kissing into an art form. Um, but, um, but this is the entrance to the kindergarten. Um, and one, one morning I was out there and there was, um, there was this mom with her kid. And uh, the kid asked her, mom, who's this? And she said, it's Elvis. <laughs> So, so it has, it has sort of definitely, I think, contributed to the spirit uh, of the place. Um, and as a last thing, sort of uh, in 2006, the VM House was got awarded the, the best building in, uh, in Copenhagen by the municipality, and the, and the award was a brass plate, like a golden plate of 10 by 10 centimeters. And with Pierre's permission, we put it in like a smile, like a gold, a gold tooth in his, uh, in his smile. Um, and, uh, and, and finally, I think sort of the VM houses have achieved the, the highest honor uh, possible in architecture is that when you play Monopoly in, uh, in Denmark, you can actually buy the VM houses for 1.4 million. Um, I'm, I'm sad to say it's the cheapest lot in the entire game. Um, um, and until recently, this used to be the view from my apartment. Um, uh, Ten years ago, it was actually where I did my thesis project from architecture school. Uh, and already then, I was interested in this idea of how could you sort of uh, escape the confines of the perimeter block as a typology, this idea of incarcerating a, a courtyard with a wall of program. And, uh, and back then, I was interested in maybe you could, you could do it by mixing different programs. Like, for instance, you could mix uh, housing and, uh, and a big sports hall that would turn the housing into an, a mountain of uh, apartments. And the sports hall would be this big public space excavated from uh, this sort of uh, solid of, uh, of, of, uh, of apartments. So um, I managed to graduate uh, with this project, but not uh, much more than that, um, until our client actually bought the site and told us that he was going to do 10,000 square meters of apartments and 20,000 square meters of parking. So we thought that maybe this idea of, of symbiosis uh, could be sort of explored once again. Like we didn't have sports, but we had a lot of cars. So essentially, rather than doing a, a sort of a, a big boring stack of apartments looking into a big block of parking, we could sort of transform all the apartments into penthouses, put them on a podium of, uh, of cars, following the, the height limits. And since Copenhagen is completely flat, if you want to have sort of a nice south-facing slope with a view, you have to do it yourself. So we sort of lowered the, uh, uh, the entire block to, to become this sort of south-facing slope. Then we cut up the, the block to not steal the view from my apartment. Um, <laughs> And then, essentially, the parking is sort of occupying the deep space facing north. Uh, and then all the apartments, they occupy the, the south side, uh, overlooking the, the surrounding uh, suburban landscape. And they sort of combine all the splendors of a suburban lifestyle, a house with a garden, but with a penthouse view and a sort of dense urban location. So this was the, the architectural model. Uh, and this is an aerial photo uh, taken last summer. Um, so essentially, the apartments, they sort of form the roof of the parking. Uh, you have a single diagonal elevator that accesses all the apartments. It's a standard product from Switzerland, because in Switzerland, they have a natural need for diagonal elevators. Um, 
and, uh, and in uh, all the apartments are accessed through these sort of galleries. And the parking itself is sort of transformed from being this sort of claustrophobic space where especially women might be afraid of parking at night into what we've termed a cathedral of car culture, like this sort of generous public space where all the floors are visible at the same time. Um, and from the outside, the main facade uh, is, is obviously the parking facing the, the, the elevated subway. Um, and um, we wanted it to be naturally ventilated, uh, so it had to be perforated um, to sort of uh, protect from wind and, uh, and, and rain, but to allow the, the, the parking to breathe. Um, and we found out that like at a 5% at a premium, we could actually do holes in six different sizes, up to three centimeters in diameter, that would transform the entire facade into this sort of gigantic rasterized image. Uh, and since we always refer to the project as the mountain, we ended up commissioning this Japanese Himalaya photographer to give us this nice photo of, uh, of Mount Everest, uh, sort of transforming the, the north facade of the building into this sort of three and a half thousand square meter uh, urban artwork. Um, it was recently transformed into some kind of a stage. Um, but if you, uh, you re-enter the, the, the parking, uh, you go into these sort of colorful uh, corridors. Um, and then it becomes almost like traveling into a parallel universe from the, the colorful and sort of urban side with cars and, and artworks into this sort of uh, south-facing urban oasis um, where sort of the wood floor of the apartments extend outside becoming a terrace and facade. Um, and as you sort of continue out further away from, uh, from your apartment into the garden, you have the grass and then you have um, uh, these planters with uh, 21 different kinds of ivy uh, that... Um, there's a, like all the rainwater that drops on the mountain is collected in a big water tank. Um, and during dry periods, there's this sort of automatic irrigation system, making sure that sort of in, in one or two years, the entire mountain should transform into this sort of Cambodian temple ruin, uh, completely covered in, uh, in green. So if you go sort of on the other side of the canal into the suburbs, it could, it could look as if sort of a, a hundred of these guys have sort of jumped over the canal and climbed up to the, uh, to the 11th floor. Um, so, th so the mountain is sort of our first example of what we like to call sort of architectural alchemy. This idea that you can actually create, uh, if not gold, then at least some kind of added value by mixing traditional ingredients, like traditional apartments and a normal parking became sort of a, a mountain of homes with gardens on top of a, of a cathedral of car culture. Um, this idea we pursued with, um, with a, a last project, uh, actually uh, in collaboration with the same client, um, which is sort of, um, this is where VM and the mountain is. This is downtown Copenhagen, this is the subway. Uh, and in this sort of new part of town that the, the master plan wanted to turn into uh, a contemporary version of traditional Copenhagen consisting of perimeter blocks but with little towers. Uh, we had to do like a big block, 500 apartments and 10,000 uh, square meters of shopping and, and office and, and a small tower. Um, so we started looking at the tower and we thought it looked kind of silly with this sort of appendix on the shoulder of the block. So we thought like, why don't we actually sort of move away the block so the tower can sort of stand on the ground. And the sort of, the, the local plan is very specific. You know, uh, the tower has to be 50 meters tall and 10 by 16 meters. And it works fine for the upper parts. They have like nice views uh, over the block to the south. But the bottom apartments, they look straight into the neighbor block. So our only sort of architectural intervention has been sort of to turn the, the bottom of the, of the tower, giving the apartments a, an unrestricted view, and sort of creating this sort of hybrid of a functional, rational tower and this sort of uh, almost like sort of eccentric historical uh, building. So that was basically the easy part. Uh, the tricky part is actually how do you do 500 apartments and, uh, and a big sort of sh chunk of offices and shops without making it this sort of anonymous, boring, modern block. Um, it sort of has these sort of giant proportions, 200 by 100 meters. Um, and the, like what you traditionally do in, in, uh, in Copenhagen is that you sort of, you do like a lot of identical apartments and then you have uh, maybe the same architects or maybe different architects design different facades that you sort of apply to create this sort of image of diversity, uh, this sort of cosmetic uh, uh, diversity. And, and we're not so, so excited by, by this sort of covering up the, the sameness, but, but, uh, but maybe some kind of real uh, difference could be interesting to, to explore. And maybe it's not so, uh, so interesting if you live like 30 meters to the left or the right, if it's the same uh, kind of house. 
But if you lift 30 meters up or down, it becomes like a world of difference. Uh, offices and shops, they like to be close to the customers, so we put them on the ground. Uh, on top, we put a layer of apartments uh, higher up. Um, but since uh, housing has less deep floor plans than, uh, than offices and shops, we suddenly get some extra space that could sort of accommodate maybe small gardens or maybe even a small street. Um, one of the most popular neighborhoods in Copenhagen is called the Potato Rose. Um, and it's these sort of the neighborhood of two-story townhouses with small gardens in front. And they have like an incredible social life that the kids can run and sort of play with their neighbors and you, you get this sort of spontaneous encounter. Uh, then we put like another layer of apartments and then a layer of what we call sort of penthouse row houses that have uh, front lawns and, uh, and roof gardens. So now we created this sort of stack of different typologies. Uh, the master plan says we have to have like a, a shortcut going through the block. Um, so we turn it into a figure eight, creating a, a straight passage from one plaza to the other. Um, and then finally, sort of offices and shops, they like daylight, but they hate sunshine. They spend energy on cooling, and they, they hate glare on the, on the computer screen. So to the south, we sort of push down the, the, the commercial parts and lift them up to the north, but also like lifting up the, those apartments to the southwest sun and view. And in reverse, to the, to the southwest corner, we sort of push it down, opening up the entire courtyard to, um, to the view and the, and the light. And this sort of distortion of the, of the urban block suddenly creates shortcuts uh, between uh, these like, little uh, urban streets in front of the, of the row houses, sort of extending uh, the public realm beyond the, the, the street level. Som bevæger sig hele vejen op i det nordøstlige hjørne, får fat i den øverste del og fortsætter hele vejen op i, uh, i toppen af karen og herfra hele vejen ned i bunden igen. So sort of to prove it, we had like one of our model Hello. people try to run sort of uh, really all the way from the, from the streets to the roof. I think we should get straight to business. Show me what you've got. It's all yours. Yes, boss, I'm on my I'll try to give you what you might be super dangerous in reality. Sugar, sugar. But um, so, so you can say sort of traditionally where sort of public life is restricted to happening on the ground floor of a, of a city. Here the, the sort of uh, the spontaneous social encounter and sort of public space actually extends all the way from the ground to, uh, to the roof of the building. And, and rather than being like this sort of architectural object that can be sort of contemplated uh, uh, as, a, as an object, it's more like sort of a, an, an urban condition, sort of a, a continuous urban uh, condition, uh, sort of invading uh, the perimeter block uh, up, through the, up through the higher levels. So uh, like these different paths intersect in this sort of crossing point in the middle uh, and get sort of continues into the, the inside of the southwest courtyard, uh, where then sort of uh, punches through the, uh, the south facade and, and penetrates all the way to the to this sort of bridge connecting back to the, to the city. Um, so uh, this sort of series of transformations uh, so created the, like turned the block into this sort of uh, infinity loop of, uh, of urban space or the eight, eight house as we call it. Um, sort of it's, uh, it's currently sort of uh, under construction. It's sort of um, actually, sort of a few days ago, we completed the, the loop up here, so me and a friend had this sort of inaugural run all the way uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, from the top to the bottom. Um, like sort of, um, Copenhagen got hit like really hard by the uh, uh, global financial crisis, and we, we also had like sort of a, a real estate bubble of almost American proportions. So as you can see, uh, <laughs> like, uh, as an architect, I'm really happy that the we managed to start, uh, to start the project uh, a little bit earlier than the neighbors. I'm not, I'm not, sure, uh, I'm not sure our investor is as thrilled as I am uh, right now. Um, but it's sort of a, uh, like the first apartments are ready in, in January and it's going to be sort of a, uh, completed uh, in uh, next summer. So it's already figured in a few sort of uh, 
so uh, like in environmental horror movies. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, these are some, some uh, construction site images, some of our architects doing a sort of on-site supervision. Um, it's actually uh, one of my friends, Kasper Astrup Skrøder, this uh, documentarist uh, that we're collaborating with to do a, a documentary called uh, My Playground, uh, which is going to be our contribution to the, um, to the Shenzhen Hong Kong Architecture Biennale here in, uh, in December. Um, and I'd like to show sort of a little uh, five-minute uh, teaser of the, of, the, of the sort of documentary on, on urban movement.
Um, yeah, the film's called My Playground, and, uh, and unlike uh, what it says here, like documentary as 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 uh, like filmmaking as with construction uh, tends to get delayed. So it's it's actually opening uh, for the first time uh, December six uh, this year in in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, well, essentially, um, um, you can say sort of ar architecture is, um, is sort of in the in the big picture is it's sort of um, the the process of continually refurbishing the surface of our planet so it actually fits to the way we want to live. <coughs> um, and, that, and that's why it's strange that the public debate about architecture in the public media uh, is quite often limited to just merely looking at the final results, like sort of contemplating the architectural object and does it look uh, beautiful or ugly or does it fit in or... Uh, and I think sort of a typical example of the, of the public debate about architecture is, you know, some kind of a naming. Does, um, does Norman Foster's uh, latest tower in London look like a, a, a gherkin or a sausage or a, a dildo? Um, so, so recently we tried to ask ourselves if you could actually tell uh, the stories about how, how the project actually came into being, like why they actually end up looking the way they do, like, me, rather than merely sort of presenting the, the final results, looking at the sort of different process of, of society, the different forces that influence the design and actually shape the buildings into what they are. Um, and to do so, we tried to ask ourselves if, if there was a way to sort of tell stories with architecture. Um, Try to see if we could invent a medium that would use sort of uh, drawings and images to actually tell these stories of uh, behind the scenes. And, and we realized that we actually didn't have to sort of invent a medium. Um, it already sort of existed in the form of a, of a comic book. Because um, essentially comic books, they use images and drawings, uh, speech bubbles and uh, exclamation marks and, and graphics and, and narrator boxes to sort of... Uh, 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 sort of communicate stories, uh, getting them across both visually and, and sort of uh, uh, mentally. Um, so we, we made this sort of comic book telling the stories about 30 of our projects. Um, we called it Yes is More, uh, which is obviously a sort of evolution of some of the ideas of, uh, of our sort of architectural heroes. Um, obviously starting with Mies van Roo's Less is More, um, the statement that sort of triggered the modernist revolution, sort of liberating architecture from the constraints of style and, and uh, history. Um, but, but quite quickly, it sort of degenerated into some kind of a minimalistic manifesto uh, and then triggered the postmodern counter revolution. Uh, Robert Venturi saying, Less is a bore, like, why do modern buildings have to be so boring? Um, after him came Philip Johnson saying, uh, I'm a whore. Um, he sort of uh, he in introduced the, the potential of promiscuity or at least. Uh, uh, openness to new ideas. When, uh, when he died uh, a few years ago, he left uh, his, uh, his Glasshart estate at, uh, uh, in New Canaan, I think with 14 different buildings that, that all looked like they had been designed by sort of radically different uh, architects, but they were all designed by him. Um, so, you know, as, as life evolves, uh, so should architecture. Um, then uh, Rem Kohlhaas, uh, my old boss, uh, saying uh, more and more, more is more. Uh, re replacing sort of uh, idealism uh, and moral judgment with sort of a, a more sort of objective observation of, in this case, identifying the impact of global capitalism on urban space. Um, then recently, uh, Obama came and sort of uh, introduced uh, optimism in a time of global uh, uh, financial crisis. Um, but maybe m I think more interesting, um, he was running uh, in opposition to uh, like a very un un uh, unpopular uh, party of, uh, because of a very unpopular president. And, and the obvious thing to do would be to, to take the traditional uh, sort of stance of the opposition and saying the opposite of the ruling regime. Uh, but rather he said sort of there are no blue states of America, there are no red states of America, there's the United States of America. The sort of, um, sort of rejecting the, the sort of the, the traditional uh, sort of reaction uh, against the establishment. Um, and, and what we are sort of essentially trying to do with, uh, with Yes is More is, um, is, uh, is sort of basically sort of departing from this sort of traditional image of the avant-garde as being sort of um, the cliche being sort of angry young men rebelling against the establishment. Uh, the sort of the typical sort of radical architect being this sort of uh, misunderstood genius uh, standing in the corner of the room angry at the world for not fitting in with, uh, with his or her ideas. Um, so, so rather than, than being defined by who or what you are against, rather than this sort of revolution against something, we're much more in interested in the idea of evolution by incorporating 
influ influences of the surrounding uh, world. Um, in fact, I think that uh, Charles Darwin is probably uh, the one who best explains uh, the sort of design method in our office. Uh, his famous diagram, the evolutionary tree from the origin of species, could be a diagram of our design process. You know that um, a project evolves through a series of generations of design meetings. Uh, at each design meeting, there's like way too many ideas. Um, only the, the sort of the most uh, fit or relevant uh, ideas uh, survive to the next stage. Uh, so we might, you know, select, um, you know, a really beautiful model and a really functional model, and we try to mate them. Uh, and then they have sort of mutant offspring. Some of them are sort of misfits or abortions, and some of them actually uh, pass their genes onto the next design process uh, and, and so on. Gradually an idea evolves. And like a very little example of this is a project we did for um, a library and, uh, and a hotel and conference center in downtown Copenhagen. A very uh, dense program on a very small site. It was kind of a difficult task. Uh, the design process was almost like this sort of struggle for survival. Um, and, and gradually, I think sort of after 96 uh, uh, sort of uh, failed attempts, this sort of idea uh, evolved of a sort of um, a rational tower that melts together with the surrounding city, uh, expanding uh, the public space uh, onto the, uh, the base of the building, almost like a Scandinavian version of the Spanish steps in Rome, uh, but sort of public on the outside as well as on the inside with the cascading reading rooms. Uh, this was like a public-private partnership. Uh, it was a competition we won uh, two years ago. Um, unfortunately, our client, uh, the private client, uh, Centerplan, was uh, funded by Roskilde Bank, uh, the first Danish bank to, to go bankrupt in the, in the crisis. <laughs> um, so now it got taken over by a Dutch investment bank, and we're actually doing a, a project uh, f for the site now, which is like trying to be almost the same, just without the tower. Uh, <laughs> Um, but um, as you can see, like Darwin doesn't only explain how a single idea evolves. Like sometimes there's, you know, something branches off. You know, in one design meeting, you, you might have like this great idea, but it doesn't really fit in with this particular context or client. But you know, in, an, in another culture with another program in another country, it might be the right answer to a completely different question. So um, as a result, we, we never throw anything out in the office. We keep uh, every single idea because you never know uh, when you might actually need it. Uh, as a result, our office has sort of uh, turned into this sort of uh, archive of, uh, of architectural biodiversity. Uh, uh, sort of really, really keep uh, every, single th every single thing we produce. Um, and, and what I'd basically like now is to, um, to try to tell the stories of like uh, two or three uh, projects or like series of projects and explain how they actually evolved uh, uh, into, what they, uh, into what they are. Um, the first story starts like a, a year and a half ago when we went to, um, uh, to Shanghai uh, to do the competition for the Danish Pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo in 2010. And we saw the mascot for the expo, this guy Hai Bao. Uh, and, he, and he looked strangely familiar. Uh, in fact, he looked like a building we had designed for a hotel conference center and, and, uh, and spa in the north of Sweden, in Umeå. And, uh, and when we submitted the project for the competition, we thought we had done a pretty cool project, but it didn't exactly look like something from the north of Sweden. Uh, and the Swedish jury didn't think so either. Um, so we, we lost the, the project um, until we had a, a meeting with a Chinese businessman from Guangxi. And he saw the, the design and he said sort of, wow, that's the Chinese <laughs> character for the word people. Um, <laughs> so this is in fact how you write people in Chinese, as in People's Republic of China. Uh, we even double checked. Uh, and at the same time we got invited to exhibit uh, at the Shanghai Creative Industry Week, so we thought like, this is too much of an opportunity, so we sort of, uh, we, you know, we've stumbled upon what could be like the, the landmark of the People's Republic of China. So we sort of hired a feng shui master, uh, scaled the building up to uh, three times to, to Chinese proportions. Um, and, and went to China. <laughs> so uh, this is the, the People's Building on the uh, Huangpu River. Uh, our two interpreters sort of reading the architecture. Uh, it went on the cover of the Wenhui Bao newspaper, uh, which made Mr. Liang Yu Chen come all the way to, uh, uh, to the exhibition, and I had the chance to actually explain him uh, the project. 
and his uh, reaction was that um, Shanghai is the city in the world with most skyscrapers. Uh, but to him, it was as if the, the connection to the Chinese roots had been cut over. But with the People's Building, for the first time, he saw an architecture that could bridge the gap between the ancient wisdom of China <laughs> and the progressive future of China. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I obviously profoundly agree with him. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Yang Yu Chen is now in prison for corruption. Um, <laughs> But, um, but like I said, Hai Bao looked familiar because he is, in fact, the Chinese character for people. Uh, and the reason they chose this mascot uh, is because um, the, the theme of the, of the expo is better city, better life, or sustainability. Um, and we thought like sustainability is quite often sort of interpreted in this sort of neo-Protestant idea that, you know, uh, it's, you know uh, it's, it's supposed to hurt in order to do good. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you're not supposed to take long, warm showers because it's not good for the environment. You're not supposed to fly on holidays because flying is bad for the environment. So, so gradually we all get this idea that sustainable life is less fun than normal life. Um, so we try to ask ourselves if we could sort of focus on examples where a sustainable city actually increases the quality of life. Um, also, we ask ourselves what could Denmark show the Chinese that would be relevant? Um, one of the biggest countries in the world, one of the smallest. Um, <laughs> China, symbolized by the dragon. In Denmark, we have a national bird, the swan. <laughs> uh, China has many great poets. But to our surprise, we discovered that in the Chinese uh, Republic's public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by An Tushun, or Hans Christian Andersen, as, as we call him. Um, so that means that all 1.3 billion Chinese have actually grown up with uh, the emperor's new clothes, um, the matchstick girl, and the little mermaid. So it's, uh, it's almost like a piece of Danish culture that has been sort of integrated into Chinese culture. Um, the biggest tourist attraction in, uh, in China is, uh, uh, is the Great Wall, uh, the only sort of man-made object that supposedly can be seen from the moon. Um, uh, the biggest tourist attraction in Denmark is uh, the Little Mermaid uh, <laughs> that can sort of hardly be seen from the canal to us. Um, so there's these obvious differences between Shanghai and Copenhagen, both port cities, but of completely different scale and, and quality. Um, but then we started looking at recent urban development. Like 30 years ago, this is like a Shanghai street, broad boulevards full of bikes. Now it's like traffic jams everywhere. And the bike has actually, actually become forbidden in many places in China to not disturb the car. Um, meanwhile, in Copenhagen, we're sort of expanding the bicycle lanes. Uh, more than a third of all uh, uh, Copenhageners commute by bike. And we have this sort of system of uh, city bikes, th these free bicycles that people can actually borrow uh, and, uh, and wheel around on. So we thought, like, why don't we actually sort of remind the Chinese of the, of the bike? We sort of uh, donate 1,000 city bikes to, to Shanghai. We conceive of the Danish pavilion as like an infrastructure for bicycles, uh, so that when you go to the expo, you should go straight to the Danish pavilion, get a Danish bicycle, and then continue to, to see Heatherwick's uh, nice pavilion and, uh, and the other pavilions. Um, so, so essentially, like these expos are quite often like a lot of sort of state finance propaganda, sort of a lot of big statements and images, but no real experience. We thought like we're not going to talk about the bike; we're just going to have people try it, and if they like it, they might uh, take it further. As I mentioned, like Copenhagen and Shanghai are port cities, but in Copenhagen, the water has become so clean that you can swim in it. One of our first projects was the the harbor bath in Copenhagen that sort of extends uh, public life into the water. Uh, and again, we thought, like, rather than talking about it, why don't we actually let the Chinese try it? So we, um, we proposed to sail a million liters of harbor water uh, from Copenhagen to Shanghai. And then the, the, ch the Chinese who have the courage, they can actually borrow a red and, a red and white swimsuit and, and dive in and feel how clean it is. Um, people normally object that it doesn't sound super sustainable to sail water from Denmark to China. Um, but in fact, the, the ships, they go full of goods from China to Denmark, and then they sail more or less empty back. So most of the ships, they actually take in seawater for ballast to remain steady at sea. So we can actually hitch a ride with a mask ship for free uh, and get the, all the water there uh, with no um, carbon footprint. Um, and in the middle of this sort of piece of uh, Copenhagen Harbor, surrounded by the Danish bikes, uh, we're going to put uh, the Little Mermaid. 
uh, not a copy, but the actual Little Mermaid. Uh, so that all 1.3 billion Chinese who actually grew up with her can now see the, 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 real, uh, the real mermaid. Um, yeah, so basically the, the pavilion itself is like a loop of exhibition and bikes, conceived as a single sort of uh, truss, almost like a ship construction. Um, and because it's naturally ventilated, uh, it uses a sort of a perforation of the facade to uh, 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 reject the, the air. And working with Arab, we sort of, uh, because the facade is uh, like in a ship, it's, it's functioning as a, as a truss. Uh, in the places that have the most stress, we, we're not allowed to perforate. So as a result, the, the architecture um, is this sort of perforated um, pattern that varies, showing the flow of forces through the steel, but also f showing the, the flow of people and bicycles through the, uh, through the pavilion. Um, yeah, so a visit to the pavilion, you enter at the mermaid pool, you, you walk through the exhibition, you come out on the roof, find a bike, jump on your bicycle, and continue through the exhibition and into uh, to Shanghai. So um, when, when we won the competition, uh, we got asked to do an exhibition at the Shanghai Urban Center. Uh, and um, to our surprise, we actually had our, some of our boards returned from the Chinese state censorship. Um, they had a few corrections. Uh, we had compared Denmark to China. And they say, the China map missed Taiwan. It's a very serious political <laughs> issue in China. We will add on, sort of, OK. Uh, then we had compared the, the swan to the dragon, and then they say, suggest change to panda. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I, uh, it's like, it's, it's almost charming the sensibility of the, of the Chinese state censorship. Um, but, but when it came out in, in Denmark that we were going to move the mermaid to, uh, uh, to, to China, uh, it, it created this sort of outcry in the Danish Nationalist Party, uh, which is this sort of anti-immigration, anti-culture, anti-practically anything party. Um, and they, they tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. Um, and for the first time in my life, I, I was invited to actually speak at the parliament, uh, explaining why it was a good idea. Uh, and uh, I kind of enjoyed the, that sort of in the morning from 9 to 11, they were debating the Danish bailout package, how many billions of kroners they were going to invest in saving the Danish economy. Then they had a 30-minute recess. And then from 11.30 to 1.30, they were discussing whether or not to send the mermaid to China. Um, but sort of to conclude, if you want to see the mermaid from May to December next year, don't come to Copenhagen, because she's going to be in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, if you do come to Copenhagen, you'll probably see an installation by uh, the, the Chinese artist uh, Ai Weiwei, um, uh, who has agreed to do a, a six month uh, ins installation in her absence. Um, but if the Chinese state intervenes, it could be a panda sort of uh, <laughs> sitting on the stone. Um, and uh, the, 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 the steel is, uh, is, is up now, and it's, it's opening in, uh, in, in May next year. Um, sort of um, um, and another sort of a series of stories, like um, as, as with the sort of Danish harbor bath, like some of our projects have dealt with this sort of uh, condition of post-industrial cities converting their uh, sort of former industrial sites into uh, places for public life, culture, and leisure. Uh, one of our first projects was this sort of a uh, maritime youth house. Uh, that sort of transformed a, a polluted site, like a third of the building budget was reserved to digging up the topsoil, then driving it on a truck one kilometer away and dumping it back into the water in this new landfill, and then paying a deposit tax of three million kroner, a third of the budget. And we found out that actually, instead of just moving the problem, uh, we could cover the entire site with a wooden deck, spend the money on, uh, on public space instead of, uh, uh, of the problem and the sort of tax. And as a result, we created this sort of dune landscape of, uh, uh, of this sort of public uh, terrace, uh, covering all the, the facilities, making sure that people didn't uh, sort of interface with uh, the polluted site. Um, and essentially sort of turning a problem into a potential, like pollution into to public space. Um, a, sim a similar sort of a situation we experienced recently um, when we, when we got invited to do a competition for uh, uh, the, the new Danish Maritime Museum. Um, 
And uh, the site is, uh, is Kronborg Castle, uh, the home of uh, Shakespeare's Prince Hamlet. Um, and Kronborg has just been appointed a uh, uh, sort of UNESCO World Heritage, World Heritage Site. Uh, and as a result, uh, they had decided to recreate the fortress, the fortification around the castle, uh, eliminating some of the old industry, including an old dry dock that was going to be covered. Um, and also because um, the Danish Maritime Museum was currently inside the, the castle and it had to be sort of put back to its sort of virgin state, uh, they got kicked out and they, they got the idea that since they were going to cover the, uh, the old dry dock anyway, they might as, as well put the museum uh, in it. Um, as this sort of basement museum. Um, but the problem was that the museum program was actually twice the size of the dock. So it was going to be this sort of two-story claustrophobic basement that wasn't allowed to stick out of the ground. Um, so we thought like rather than sort of drowning the, the dock in, in museum program, if we could sort of keep it empty, it would be this sort of 150 meter uh, long, 25 meter wide, 10 meter deep public space like sunken into a uh, into the ground, like eight, eight meters below the, the sea level. Um, so um, when we started reading the technical reports, because the dock is old uh, and right now it's full of water, when you empty it, the pressure from the earth and the water on the outside would make the walls cave in. So we would have to make a new dock inside the dock to sort of take the pressure or hammer down some, uh, some, uh, some dock walls on, on the outside to, to, um, to take the pressure before it hits the, the, the old dock. So we thought, like, if we're going to make a new dock anyway, why don't we actually sort of move it so far away that we can actually accommodate the museum between the, the new and the old dock walls? Uh, it would basically be like this sort of public void uh, surrounded by museum. Um, and it sort of allowed us to address the dilemma of the project that, you know, UNESCO said that the, the muse museum had to be completely invisible. Uh, but the museum director and the museum sponsors, they wanted some kind of a architectural masterpiece that would sort of <laughs> attract people to, to go and visit. Um, and by turning it into a void, we could sort of combine the need for invisibility with the desire for sort of maximum exposure, uh, essentially like turning the, the brief of the museum inside out. Um, all we had to do was design like three bridges, one to sort of stop the water from coming in, one to connect the, the docklands to the, to the castle, and one that would sort of bounce off the wall and take people down into the, into the museum. Each of these bridges have a thickness containing a museum program or auditoria or the cafe. Um, and, and they sort of also allow uh, daylight to penetrate deep into this sort of otherwise kind of uh, underground uh, building. So essentially like the bridges, they, they sort of continuous descent from the top to the bottom of the dock. Uh, and finally the big uh, public space. Um, so and, and because you sort of gradually descend, you go from this like almost like human scale uh, building, the, the ceiling height gradually gets more and more generous until you are in the sort of industrial scale uh, uh, big hall uh, at the end of the, of the museum. So when we submitted it to the competition, we thought like there was no way in hell we could ever win this competition because there was like one condition in the brief and that was that you had to build inside the dock and our museum was around it. Uh, but the jury liked it and we, we won the competition and, uh, and we're sort of starting to move ahead when, um, when something strange happened. The, um, the Danish Architects Association, which is essentially our union, uh, they sued the client for having chosen uh, a project that sort of broke the conditions of the, of the competition. Um, they didn't dispute that it was the right thing to do. They just said that they weren't allowed to do it. Um, at, at which point we sort of severely reconsidered uh, our membership of, uh, of the Danish Architects Association. Um, <laughs> But, but happily, like, the clients had become so convinced of the project at this point that they sort of decided to, to confess everything, cancel the competition, and hire us as their architects. Um, so now we're actually um, sort of submitting the construction documents uh, in, in February for the, uh, for the museum. Um, the last sort of uh, story deals with like, sort of some of our recent work, um, you know, sort of until until two years ago, like all our work was actually within uh, like Copenhagen or at least Scandinavia. Uh, like then there was the global financial crisis and the sort of real estate bust in, uh, in Denmark. And, and now sort of practically all our work is, uh, is outside Denmark. And, and a lot of it is actually sort of in the former uh, Soviet Union. Um, so we have sort of uh, three projects that sort of at different uh, 
in different ways deal with um, with sort of the quite diverse uh, decision making in these sort of uh, various uh, sort of post-Soviet uh, new democracies. Uh, the first project uh, was a competition we did for the new town hall of Tallinn, uh, the capital of Estonia. Uh, it's this uh, like beautiful uh, world heritage uh, city. Like, seems like everything we do these days uh, deals with some kind of world heritage. Um, and essentially, the, the medieval city currently contains the, uh, the city hall. Um, and it's spread out on 11 different buildings. And they wanted to put it all uh, together. Uh, it's surrounded by the old moat, which is sort of this green belt. And the basic idea was to basically sort of uh, move a sample of the, of the medi medieval town core, uh, creating a new bridge uh, towards the Gulf of Finland, sort of extending the city out towards the water. Um, so to create the connection, we, we proposed to rearrange the traffic, uh, lowering some of the streets under the, uh, the park, and creating this sort of new uh, meeting point. And because the, the new city hall won't, won't just be the, uh, the, the city council, it'll also be all the sort of public departments, and it will also be all the sort of public service, so where people go to talk about uh, uh, like daycare, uh, kindergartens, uh, how to take care of the elderly, or uh, sort of social security. Uh, so we thought like rather than having this sort of a traditional relationship between uh, town hall and, and public space, we could sort of allow the public space to extend uh, uh, sort of uh, within the building, like becoming this sort of um, public service marketplace, um, allowing people to sort of to enter and sort of interface with the, with the public servants. Um, and the, and the program consisted of these sort of 11 different departments plus uh, the city council. Um, and uh, they, they, they all came from like separate buildings. Um, so we tried to sort of, um, rather than making this sort of big block outside the, the medieval city, we created this, uh, this sort of uh, network of, uh, of individual departments, uh, almost like a, a village of, uh, uh, of public service. Um, because all of the departments have like slightly different sizes, they end up forming this sort of slightly irregular network, but they also serve as a single floor plate, so you have the benefits of a compact uh, organization, but still the identity of, of each department, uh, each department having its own view. Uh, and because of these light wells and courtyards, uh, you actually get like very deep and compact floor plans, but with a lot of sort of daylight uh, um, distributed uh, evenly. So the, the result was this sort of um, uh, public village, as we call it. So the, the master plan uh, actually, um, which is also like somehow tradition in, in Scandinavia or like Northern Europe, anticipated an urban perimeter block with a tower on it. Um, so we sort of put this village, lifted it up to, uh, to hit the sort of uh, maximum heights, uh, creating this sort of uh, public service marketplace beneath it. Because um, you have like a lot of rain and snow in Estonia, we tilted the roofs, uh, tilted the ground to accommodate like auditoria and, uh, and other functions. Uh, daylight uh, passing all the way through the, the offices uh, and down to the, the spaces beneath. Uh, in a single place, like all the inhabitants can actually sort of access the roof and enjoy the, uh, the sort of UNESCO skyline of, uh, of Tallinn. And so the, the, f the final element uh, in the master plan, they had anticipated a tower because like in... Uh, I guess in European cities, you can hardly imagine a city hall without a city hall tower. Um, so we thought, thought like, what, what can we put in there? And we thought maybe it could be an idea to place the, the city council um, inside the tower. Uh, you have like this big sloping roof. Um, and we thought, we thought it could be made out of a, a gigantic mirror. And the main idea is that when the, sort of the, the politicians are sitting down, uh, taking decisions of the city, they can look up. Uh, and through this sort of democratic periscope, they can uh, sort of get a political overview of the city they're actually uh, taking decisions about. Um, but in reverse, it also creates the possibility that uh, uh, when, when, the angry, uh, when the angry public sort of uh, uh, congregates uh, outside the tower, they'll actually look straight in. And if they have the eyesight to do it, they can read the meeting minutes and they can find out exactly what's being decided uh, as, as, they, uh, as they protest. Um, so uh, to our sort of happy surprise, uh, uh, like the mayor really loved this idea and we, uh, we won the competition. Uh, we, we are starting construction documents in uh, the 1st of January. Um, 
but, uh, but when we recently presented this idea to uh, one of our latest clients, uh, the, the president of, uh, of Kazakhstan, and we explained this idea, and he said that you know, if, uh, if he had been on the jury, we would have lost because of this idea. Because uh, sort of public insight into the decision making is not, uh, uh, is, uh, is not on the menu in Kazakhstan. Um, and um, we, we were basically uh, in, invited to participate in a competition to design the National Library of Kazakhstan. And, and Kazakhstan um, was the last uh, Soviet Republic to gain independence of Russia in 91. Um, and when they, when they did so, they actually decided to move their capital city um, 1,600 kilometers from Almaty to Astana uh, into the heart of the country. Um, and right now they're in the process of making this sort of a new capital city with all the public institutions of a, of a capital, uh, one of the things being a, a national uh, presidential library. Um, so um, it, it was located in a park and a sort of one of our ideas, we thought it could be interesting to uh, sort of, Kazakhstan is actually the ninth biggest country in the world. Uh, surprisingly, like all of us only know of it because of Borat. Uh, but like the, uh, the, the reason that it takes so long to fly all the way to China is because for three hours you're flying over Kazakhstan. Um, so um, we decided to, make the, to ma turn the park into this sort of a cross-section of all the different climate zones, all the different landscapes of Kazakhstan, considering it almost like sort of a, uh, an, a library of plants and, uh, and, and minerals. So the journey uh, through the park would be like a journey through the Kazakh landscape. Um, and in the heart of it, we were going to place the, the library um, and sort of um, essentially uh, a library is, if you like it, sort of a, uh, the combination of a really rational and sort of intuitively an, um, navigable uh, uh, archive of, uh, of books and then a lot of public spaces to, to reach those books. And, and since sort of uh, most libraries are organized uh, according to the Dewey Decimal System, um, uh, Natasha knows this more than anyone, uh, but uh, from uh, spanning from 000 to 999, um, the sort of the ideal organization would be this sort of linear uh, 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 organization. The problem of a, of a linear uh, archive would be that you have like the dead ends would give like a lot of uh, sort of redundant circulation back and forth. So we thought like we would turn it into a perfect circle <coughs> that would actually allow the, the sort of intuitive overview of linear organization with the infinite circulation of a, of a circle. Um, and then all the other functions uh, would include like uh, reading rooms. They would like to be sort of on the outside with daylight and views of the city. Conference spaces on the inside, uh, well connected. Uh, public uh, lobby and arrival uh, on the ground and sort of ad administration and research in the sort of attic. Uh, and to combine these sort of four ideal locations, we made this sort of uh, public program wrapping around the, the, the perfect circle. Uh, you know, from the from the attic to the outside to the to the downstairs to the inside. In a way, combining the the virtue of a of a vertical organization with arrival and administration, diagonal organizations creating views across the different levels, and finally the horizontal organization for the reading rooms uh, and the and the conference spaces. Um, and uh, to create sort of an envelope uh, around this sort of uh, like ideal diagram. Um, we just made this sort of a simple rectangle uh, following the shape that actually creates a, a Mebius strip, this sort of mathematical uh, shape that has the attribute that if you were an ant walking on the facade, you would actually sort of walk both on the underside and, and, uh, and the inside, uh, like one single surface uh, wrapping around the entire uh, library. Um, so we placed it sort of uh, in the park. It creates this sort of gateway where you sort of enter into the a sort of a central courtyard, and depending on where you see it from, it sort of it radically changes its, uh, its, uh, its silhouette. Um, so because, because they are in the process of sort of redefining the national identity with this sort of new capital, they are quite interested in the creation of, of like public monuments. So uh, this was by far the president's favorite slide. Uh, we sort of demonstrated the, that it would combine the, the sort of the arch types of the, of the ring, the, the rotunda, the, uh, the arch, and maybe even uh, that the media strip somehow uh, like resembled the, the traditional yurt, this sort of uh, Kazakh tent of the nomad uh, people, um, if you like. Um, 
so the uh, the building the the central courtyard from where you enter into the into the library. So on on one way it's like this sort of really rigorous and efficient uh, uh, diagram like circulation uh, uh, vertical circulation, um, the con continuity of public programs, and then one last program which is sort of nested between the the envelope the facade of the building and the and the diagram is this sort of a uh, museum uh, portraying the, the creation of the Kazakh independent state and democracy, um, which is this sort of a loop uh, that sort of occupies the space beneath the warping skin and the, and the sort of the continuous uh, public program. Um, then we worked with, um, uh, with Arab and, uh, and, and Rambul to, uh, to sort of uh, figure out the structure, but essentially like a very basic idea of like a a load-bearing central structure with a very light skin uh, wrapped around it. And depending on where you cut, it's like this sort of perfect horizontal and vertical uh, building or this sort of uh, crazy uh, diagonal where you actually have these short sh uh, like connections, visual connections across the different levels. And finally, because the building is, uh, is continually uh, turning in plan and section, or the envelope is, um, uh, every part of the facade is, is having like a different thermal exposure and using Ecotect we are we're working with this idea of uh, that the facade will sort of respond to uh, the amount of thermal exposure by sort of varying its degree of, of openness uh, creating this sort of play of, of, of light and shadow on the, on the shape. Um, yeah, so I'm saying the plants also combine this like very rigorous uh, radial uh, grid with this sort of a uh, program and, and especially the envelope meandering around it. Uh, and the sort of the exit through the, the gate. So um, it was like a, um, it was a competition I think with, the, with like 30 something uh, submittals. Uh, Norman Foster was, was supposed to be on the jury uh, but uh, he decided th that he wanted to submit uh, some projects instead, uh, <laughs> the, the bastard. Uh, he, he, uh, a, a, according, according to, the, to the president, he actually presented three alternative schemes. But strangely, the, the president and the city architect somehow insisted on this project, even though it was like, not from the most famous architect in the world. Um, and, and we were like, a little bit wondering like, how come that uh, the president has, in our minds, so cool taste in architecture. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, recently, we, we went down to sort of... Um, to sign the contract uh, for the for the project, and uh, and in the sort of the city architect's office, we saw this lamp hanging in the in the ceiling. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, I don't know. Sort of, uh, I think it's just kind of interesting. As as an architect, we always try to find like super rational and sort of rigorous ways of analyzing our way to some kind of brilliant answer to like the the, the right design and. In the end, it's the lamp in the, in the city architect's <laughs> office that, uh, that calls the shots. Um, but so sort of during this process, uh, um, meanwhile, uh, uh, the president had decided to move the site of the library closer to the, uh, to the president's palace. And um, be, uh, like right after signing the contract, they took us out to see the new site. And, uh, and just to show you how things work in Kazakhstan, they had already uh, started digging a round hole uh, <laughs> where they were like more or less expecting the, the library to go. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the basic deal was that we had to make this sort of a floating plate uh, foundation, like hammering down these uh, uh, like concrete piles in a 120 by 120 grid, casting a one meter slab so we could essentially put the building more or less anywhere on that disk. Uh, just so we could get started right away, and we're submitting the, the, the DD phase, uh, um, design development, uh, uh, before Christmas. Um, yeah, so basically, the, 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 sort of the, the last project that I'd like to show is, um, is again dealing with this sort, of, uh, this sort of like strange turmoil of how things actually happen in the world. Uh, you say, as an architect, you might be driven by sort of ideals or sort of a, a strategy about dealing with sustainability or, uh, or wh whatever sort of uh, gets you going. But um, it's, uh, it's almost impossible for architects to really sort of assert an agenda uh, because we don't have the resources to finance it and we don't have the political power to, to sort of decide it. 
Um, so the projects we, we end up actually realizing are much more the product of sort of spontaneous improvisation and sort of uh, reactions to like the turmoil of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the political and economical forces of the world. Um, a kind of clear example is a project uh, like last summer, we were so lucky that we actually won the competition to design a Scandinavian national bank located sort of at the heart of, uh, of the capital. Um, this was the, the director of the bank's office. Uh, this was the director of the bank when he was still smiling. Um, so when we won the competition, we were extremely excited that we now we had the opportunity to sort of to, to recreate and revitalize the center of the, the city and make this sort of significant uh, public building. Um, Unfortunately, it was, the, it was the National Bank of Iceland. Um, so sort of, uh, yeah, actually, actually when we were celebrating uh, the win, uh, I, like, sort of, I was opening, uh, we had bought champagne for the entire office, and I was like opening the first bottle and sort of proposing a toast, celebrating that the, for the first time we were actually working directly for the people who print the money. So uh, like <laughs> only two things could go wrong. Like uh, either the Atlantic fault line would crack open and all of Iceland would sink <laughs> into the Atlantic Sea, or the entire country would have to go bankrupt. And like, uh, you know, n none of this could ever happen. So, so, um, but sort of two weeks before the the the, the ceremony, uh, all of Iceland went bankrupt, and uh, uh, all we got out of it was like a, a handshake from the president. Um, but around the same time, we had a visitor, uh, a minister from Azerbaijan, coming to Denmark. Um, and we had the chance to take him to, to, to our office, show, show him some of our work. And we took him to, to show him the mountain. Uh, and he liked a lot of the ideas. And he especially liked this idea that you could actually make mountains out of architecture. Uh, and he told us that the Baku, the, the capital of Azerbaijan, um, uh, is uh, like facing this big crescent bay overlooking a desert island that would be perfect for, for human life. Right now, it's just a piece of desert. It's an old Navy base that was abandoned. Uh, now, now there's nothing. Um, and uh, the president never opened it for development because he was afraid that if you're going to make some kind of wall of uh, mediocre development, you would sort of ruin the view of the Caspian Sea for the entire capital. Uh, but the, pr uh, the minister's idea was that um, since Azerbaijan is known as the Alps of Central Asia, perhaps we could recreate the silhouettes of the seven most significant mountains of Azerbaijan in the form of an urban development. Um, so I mean, we, we thought it sounded like a pretty crazy idea. Um, so we gave it a shot. Uh, and um, and uh, I'd like to finish by showing this like, uh, short movie that we made to sort of explain some of the ideas of the project. And uh, we quite often make, make movies about our work. Uh, but we always argue for a very long time uh, about the soundtrack to put on the movie. Uh, but in this case, it was like a, it was like a really easy choice. <laughs> So, um, so essentially, Baku operates like a, you know, it's a diagram of a crescent moon overlooking a, a small island, like the diagram of, uh, of their flag. Uh, and our, our task was to sample uh, the geometries of the seven most significant mountains and sort of uh, translate them and interpret them into sort of rational, functional structures for, for human life and sort of uh, 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 urban accommodation. Uh, and then to position them on the island surrounding this sort of uh, central valley of a big uh, green park. And because the island is a piece of desert, it has no existing infrastructure. It has no water, no roads, no energy. We decided to, to consider it like a, a giant ecosystem using uh, wind power to drive desalination plants, creating fresh water, using the thermal properties of the sea and the water to heat and cool the building, using uh, solar heat panels to create warm water, and then finally, all the wastewater that the human uh, activity creates, instead of putting it into a sewer, we created these sort of uh, root zone gardens that sort of organically clean the water, uh, organically uh, sort of gradually increasing the, the amount of water on the island, uh, sort of uh, gradually transforming it from this sort of a, a dry desert into a, a green lush landscape. And, and where sort of urban development quite often happens at the expense of nature, here it actually creates the nature. Uh, and, and like actual mountains, the, the buildings uh, and the, the urban structures function like ecosystems. They sort of create shelter from the wind. They uh, uh, accumulate the heat of the sun. They sort of collect all the all the rainwater. Um, 
So um, after six months of work, we presented the project to the to the president um, and uh, and, um, and Zero Island, uh, also called the Seven Peaks of Azerbaijan, uh, are now going to be sort of the first uh, carbon neutral island in uh, in Central Asia. Um, so sort of to conclude, I, th I think this sort of a last project also shows that not only is there some kind of a evolution of ideas within uh, the creation of a single a single project, but also uh, across projects, uh, there's like this sort of transmis transmission of ideas, like uh, an office uh, uh, almost becomes like an ecosystem of ideas, like passing from one project to, uh, to another. And, uh, and, and, and it's not only this sort of like linear process of sort of analysis and conception, because like quite often in the decision making, there's this sort of highly irrational uh, element uh, and sort of uh, incredible sort of significance of chance. That, for instance, what started, if you like, as, uh, as, as, uh, as some of my experience with my thesis project turned into uh, the mountain in Copenhagen that evolved into sort of the seven peaks of, uh, of Azerbaijan. And, um, and if, the, you know, if, the, if the minister hadn't had this sort of slightly megalomaniac and slightly literal vision about like, recreating these seven mountains, we would never have been able to, to turn the entire island into this, uh, this ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bjarki, for um, the, uh, the entertaining lecture and tall tales. Um, bef before we head around the corner for some drinks, we thought we might do um, a few questions just uh, here in the formal construct of the lecture theater. Um, Scrap, do we have another mic or we use this one? Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Biake? Um, uh, Biake, first, first of all, you know, thanks, thanks for coming over and giving us uh, such an entertaining lecture. I think I want to return back to um, one of your statements about the avant-garde. Uh, you seem to term the avant-garde as uh, an architect or a young architect that struggles against the world and that is uh, angry all the time and so on and so forth. Um, somehow I don't see that as a definition of a young avant-garde. I think uh, a young avant-garde in a way perhaps is angry because I think there is an internal struggle to rethink the profession. So perhaps that angriness, perhaps that that dissatisfaction is a dissatisfaction that wants to, uh, to contribute to the lineage of architectural history, architectural experimentation, and the discipline itself. Um, looking at your presentation, everything looks incredibly... I also, I also, it is the cliché that I'm referring to. I'm not saying that all young architects are... I, I, have, I, I haven't finished my question. Either you're clairvoyant or, you know. So, I, I, see, I see there's an incredible ease of uh, creation within the, within the project that you do, which is very refreshing. Uh, but I wonder for, for <coughs> us students in, in the context of BAA, uh, what do you think that you're struggling against? What, what, what was difficult in, in your practice? Or what was difficult to you doing architecture? Um, I mean, I, th I think, um, I mean, I think the, the basic uh, proposition is, um, I mean, I think quite often you hear architects, like, uh, you know, when architects get together, uh, and I think we all recognize this, they always bitch about everybody, you know, like all the other architects and, uh, and all the clients and all the legal issues and all the handicap accessibility uh, requirements and, uh, you know, the, the lousy budgets and, uh, and the, the latest building code and sort of, um, so, and there's this sort of general notion that um, uh, like sort of real life uh, is one sort of succession of compromise, watering down uh, built work to the lowest common denominator. Um, and that you almost have to um, not give a shit about uh, all these uh, limitations uh, and, inst and instead sort of pursue some kind of uh, freedom but then in the, in the sort of void of what to do, you then need to sort of uh, um, pursue like French philosophy or uh, the Kabbalah or like some other 
uh, sort of complex things to, to, you know, make your work interesting. And I, and I think our sort of general proposition is that all these forces that are quite often opposing forces uh, can actually sort of in an almost sin-like manner be turned into the driving forces of your design. Like, uh, rather than coming with some kind of fair complete that deals with, uh, let's say, French philosophy, uh, that then sort of bounces against uh, like all these other requirements. Uh, the real world is actually so complex and so interesting that just by digging into uh, the, the often quite practical issues of the real world, you might be able to tie that into uh, a quite sort of uh, uh, advanced or complex architectural uh, uh, expression that just merely Listening to the real estate agent, you know, people like to have a house with a garden, but they also want to have a penthouse view, or, uh, you know, cars, they like deep spaces, uh, uh, houses, they like uh, sunshine, you know, like very basic and, and really banal things that sort of uh, independently would, would just be like almost too banal to even talk about. But like, if you have uh, enough of this, you can actually tie it into a sort of a Gordian knot of ideas, and it will actually feed your architecture rather than sort of inhibiting it. And, and you can actually come up with something like surprising or complex uh, without uh, some kind of occult uh, exercise. Uh, just a question, Biaki, while everyone else is thinking. Um, uh, there's something kind of desperately likable about the way that you present each of your projects. Um, I spoke about in the, in the intro the, the idea of the catchphrase. And I wonder if, if, if there's a kind of deliberate act of seduction that you or in your office kind of put forward, you know. Um, to what extent is, is this idea where you, you kind of t distill the complexities of um, an architectural project or the evolution of that project down to the iconography of the phrase or the one-liner or the icon? Um, and, and at what stage does that kind of occur in the process? Is it, is it something that's, 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 that's done for the the medium of the lecture, or perhaps the, for the seduction of the client. Because um, it speaks to the role of humor in, in the work, which is um, incredibly strong, I suppose. I mean, I, I think um, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with, uh, with uh, Olafur Eliasson about this, actually, because I, um, so the, unlike other artists, he's very sort of uh, verbal about what he does and very verbal about it uh, sort of within his practice. They have these sort of weekly lectures where he, he, uh, he lectures for the office uh, about his latest uh, ideas. And, and I think we spend a lot of time continually trying to rephrase and reiterate what it is we're doing. Because if you are conscious about what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's easier to stick to it. Like, because uh, you know, in the, in the process of realizing a project, you will meet countless uh, conflicts uh, where you have to somehow prioritize and you have to sort of choose the right solution. You have to sacrifice the, uh, the least important issues or like sort of, and, um, and if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, uh, it's gonna be uh, like more difficult to resist. And also, um, you know, if you are, if you're a sculpture, you can uh, you can hammer on a block of marble until it looks like uh, uh, the girl you're trying to uh, to model or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, so you basically don't need anybody but uh, your hands and your hammer and your chisel. But w if you're an architect, you can't even uh, you can't even do build a one to fifty model without being a team on it. Uh, so in order to make the entire team uh, collaborate on the same idea, in order to make the engineers sign off that this actually holds and the client that this is what he wants and the users that this is what they, they need and uh, the banker that this, is, this can be financed and the real estate agent that it can be sold and the city architect that it fits in and the contractors that it's gonna, you know, that they can do it and blah, blah, blah. Um, you, you end up like for even like a medium sized project, you have maybe like three or 400 people that need to be convinced or they, at least they need to get it in order to be able to do it or to get it in order to be able to want it. So, uh, so I think from the early stages of conception all the way to completion, you constantly need to be able to place your idea or the idea in a lot of other people's heads. Uh, and if they don't get it, uh, you can be assured that the uh, things are gonna fuck up. Uh, so, uh, 
so I, I think it's like almost the most important tool of, the, of an architect is to um, to make the ideas tangible and graspable and, and transmissible. And maybe just to follow on from that, I mean, there's something that, that's sort of intriguing and, and, and exciting about the transfer of one medium from, from something into another. And in, in, in the book, you're engaged in the medium of comics. Um, the, one of the films you show, which I know is in, um, in the making, the, the, the parkour film, um, or even just the way they describe the projects as, as stories, not as kind of straight kind of architectural projects. Um, this idea of uh, retelling architecture through different vehicles, um, I mean, is there something that you find sort of desperately inadequate about the medium of architecture in itself that, that, that warrants this, um, uh, this investigation with other media, I suppose? I mean, I mean, if, uh, I, mean um, I mean, like, I, I, obviously, of course, the ideal would be like reportedly Gaudi. He was not, uh, he was like building, he was building columns on site and then he tore them down and then he erected it in another angle. I mean, that would be the coolest. Uh, <clears throat> but um, so I, I, th I think in order to get to the point where you actually get to realize the, the built building, you have to uh, transmit the ideas so, so many times that even to get a chance to, to live, uh, it has to live in advance in other forms of, uh, of, of media. And, and then I think it's quite important for, because um, you know, obviously like the latest drug, uh, the, the last couple of years in the office has been uh, like, uh, like grasshopper essentially. Uh, and then sort of, but, uh, but, but, but grasshopper is like a small, a small fraction that allows you to do certain investigations. Uh, but you know, then you need to print it out uh, physically or slice it out uh, with a laser cutter and sort of then do things and like, so I think every time you change media, you're gonna discover new things, you're gonna look at the project from new angles and you're gonna get new information that's gonna uh, allow you to uh, conceive something the next time. And I, like with the, with the, with the infinity loop, like the eight house building, uh, we had the problem that we couldn't take a single money shot of the building. Uh, uh, like that. sort of either, we, either sort of, we, we were gonna have to digest the fact that it was never gonna look good on photos or, or instead we made a movie about it. Um, so, um, and, and, and suddenly, you know, in film, this, this sort of idea of urban continuity and, uh, and, the, and the sort of this sort of transformation of public space through the, through the building uh, came alive. So also like some ideas show really well in, in some forms. And, and if, you are, uh, if your project is not sort of specifically about beautiful facades, uh, like frontal photography might not be the right, uh, the right medium. I just wanted to ask, um, why have you decided to publish a book? Uh, <laughs> good idea. Uh, uh, good, yeah, good question. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we ever asked ourselves that question. Um, no, but I, I, I essentially, I think. Um, I mean, I, I think it's. I think it's quite important in architecture and the discourse about architecture that uh, uh, that different voices engage in the debate. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, of course, the best way to sort of uh, experience architecture is to go there, and then uh, hopefully you will be able to experience at least the effects of some of all the th thoughts and efforts that have been put into the, into the project. You might not be able to decode why things actually are the way they are, but you might experience, uh, you know, that, that's, that some, some of the spaces really work well uh, and you really like to stay there or like you really get efficiently for it made to be or uh, the apartments are really nice to live in or you might experience that some things work less well. But it, it and, and maybe you can analyze then sort of if you have the patience why this is. Um, but because architecture is, is very much an art form that is driven by, by parameters and sort of uh, uh, in, intentions, concerns, uh, that have been sort of uh, invested into the project. I think it is quite relevant to uh, communicate uh, the process behind why it is, why things have evolved to the way they are, why they became what they are. And, um, and one way of doing it is to, is to lecture about it. Uh, but a, an, another form would, would be to, to make a book about it. So therefore, when, when we wanted to, uh, to make the book, essentially to communicate the ideas of our, of our work, um, 
we were desperately trying to find a form that would be suitable uh, to tell these stories, and uh, and we weren't sure that the the classic architectural publication uh, would be able to do that because like essentially architects tend to skip the text and just look at the images. Uh, so if you would come with like the essay and then the the plans and the pictures. Uh, people would probably never get the, to read the, the essay. So, uh, so instead we try to essentially translate the form of a lecture or like a, a physical meeting with the architect into, uh, into a book form. Yeah, I mean, um, this is a relatively short presentation, but like, um, uh, if you buy the book, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a chapter called The Clover, f the, or actually Battlefield, uh, which was like uh, our first and perhaps last uh, attempt at sort of uh, architectural pro action, uh, which was. There was a, um, four years ago, there was like uh, political elections in the municipality of Copenhagen, and the social democratic mayor candidate came with a, with a vision that she was going to do 5,000 affordable homes within the next five years. And, uh, and just from that slogan, we thought it, it was very relevant because like, I, I think like on the same day, there was an article that the, c the city hospital of Copenhagen had like 36 vacant positions for nurses because nurses and policemen and people with like a normal income uh, weren't, they couldn't afford to live in Copenhagen. Um, so, so we thought like, where is she gonna put all these houses? And we proactively proposed a project that ended up stealing like two years of our lives uh, for how to sort of accommodate 5,000 uh, homes within the existing uh, uh, sort of urban fabric of Copenhagen. Um, and that became like sort of a very violent engagement with politics. But essentially, like uh, in, in a lot of our in a lot of our work, um, so essentially depending on which project it is, and depending on, on, on how the decision making is in the in the in the in the specific context, um, uh, political issues sometimes become the the key issue. You know, functionalists believe that form follows function, but quite often, form follows regulations or or context or handicap accessibility or whatever it is. Uh, so, depending on what was the key challenge in a specific project, uh, and if it was the key challenge was a political issue, that became the driving force. Um, we, we have a series of projects in uh, in Copenhagen that deal with density, and there again, the one of the main issues is the political uh, resentment or fear of uh, of building essentially denser and taller than the traditional five-story perimeter block. So. Um, a lot of stories about politics in the comic book. Thanks. Uh, first of all, congratulations on finally doing a comic book, which is something you wanted to do since you were a kid. And secondly, the question is, you keep talking about evolution, evolution of ideas and evolution of form in some way through the ideas. But when we look at the book of this guy that used to work for you, whose name I don't remember, sorry about that, 1001 Building Forms, it seems that like some of the forms that you're actually using in the end were prescribed at some point by, in this case, this person. And I could cite a couple of projects, but my point is, is it really necessary to use all this storytelling to, in the end, try and validate the use of a particular form that we found interesting? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, think, uh, I think it exactly is. I mean, I, um, 
I, I guess you were referring to Francois Blanchiac, who, who used to work in a, in our office. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think f sort of a, an isolated formal study is, you know, interesting uh, on its own as sort of an as sort of a self-referential little doodle. But it, it's a little bit like trying to to get dibs on a thousand one projects without ever conceiving a single one. And I, and I think what's what's interesting in architecture is not so much if it's round or square or triangular, but how it uh, responds to uh, some specific conditions and actually how it uh, uh, it reveals aspects of, uh, of life or society and how it sort of enables uh, aspects uh, of life uh, uh, or society. Um, so I'm much more interested in what the form does uh, and, uh, and why it does it than, uh, than, than what it is. I mean, in the end, I'm as shape horny as everybody else. You know, we architects, we dig cool shit. Uh, but uh, I think it's interesting when you discover it and where it actually uh, evolves from. I mean, in, in, my, in my mind, architecture is the means uh, to a goal, and, the, and to a goal, and uh, and the goal is like human life, or let's say like maximizing the potential unfolding of human life. Um, so, so therefore, it's it's a bridge. It's not a it's not an end. Um, point. Yeah. Do you have one more? <laughs> well, one one more from me. Um, um, I, I think if, if we were to take uh, Ram's uh, uh, summary of, of the 60s to, to the architectural production of the 60s to the late 90s, uh, him saying 60s to 60s to 80s is the age of abundance. 80s to the noughties is the age age of access. And in a way, it encapsulates a lot uh, about uh, mass consumption, excessive consumption. And in a way, I think the title Yes is Small encapsulate that, that, uh, that condition, as you've uh, pointed out in, in, in the start of the lecture. And, and of course, I think just the one year ago and, and recently, I think there's this whole notion about, uh, or people are already calling it the age of austerity when more people are already saying no to many things, no to no to access, no to uh, iconic buildings, no to many things. So uh, what are your thoughts uh, with regards to the, to the shift uh, with, within, within the year that passed and between the slogan of yes is more? Will, will, will the sequel of your book be no is more? Uh, um, I, I seriously doubt it. But I mean, I think, um, <coughs> I, I think actually, um, I mean, we, we, we did make the exhibition and uh, like we, we made the book um, uh, sort of in uh, in six weeks in uh, uh, in January and, and the beginning of February, uh, at a time where sort of uh, five of our major clients had gone bankrupt, uh, the Icelandic bank had gone down, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, everybody were like super depressed, uh, like all the major artificial offices in Denmark had laid off like half the people. Everybody was expecting, you know. Uh, that the world was going to go down the drain, and there's like all this talk about uh, sustainability and limits of growth, and uh, you know we have to return to some kind of uh, romantic uh, pre, uh, you know, modern sta uh, stage or whatever. And um, and I think I, I think this uh, idea of, uh, of 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 saying no, this sort of negative approach. Um, it's, it's sort of counterproductive. I think the reason, like one of the main reasons that ecology and sustainability hasn't gone further than it has, has is because it has been dominated by uh, tree huggers or uh, sort of people with some kind of moral impediment saying, you know, we're not supposed to have it this nice, you know, uh, we should not have a car, even though if you have kids, it's like super unpractical not to have one or sort of. Uh, we're not supposed to do all these things, and I and I think then it's gonna it's never gonna be, you know, we didn't invent all these machines and all these uh, services to uh, you know fuck up the planet. We invented them because they would actually increase the quality of life. They would extend our lifetime. They would improve our health. Uh, you know, they would in general be, you know, improving our life quality. But at the time when we invented them, we didn't know the consequences of certain side effects. 
now that we know, now, now that we get more knowledge, we can factor in these uh, parameters into our new designs. And, and rather, than, rather than sort of advocating some kind of recession, it would be much more interesting to say, uh, like r rather than having to choose between this or that, like try to make everybody happy, but do it in a way where uh, like nobody limits each other and where you, you can actually fly on holidays and uh, uh, have a, a, a zero carbon footprint uh, if need be. So, um, so I, it's, just a, it's just a different approach. And, um, and, and, I, and I think a much more sort of productive approach than, uh, than, uh, than the, sort of the classical sort of negativity. And you know, when Rincola says this, he's just saying it as a vehicle to propose another kind of formalism, which is just, you know, you're just re realizing that it was, gonna, it was getting hard to beat Saha at shapes. Uh, so, uh, so then you could beat her at uh, you know non-shapes. Um, essentially, he even confessed it. You know, he said that the most of most of his uh, career has been about trying to compete with uh, with his friends and colleagues, and he's just trying to find new ways of beating them. Um, Because he is, I think, without doubt, one of the most optimistic people I know. So I think no is more is just a non-starter. Um, yeah, no can be very optimistic as well. It can be, but I think, I think it's an interesting pitch to just um, use yes as the starter rather than say no um, as, a, as a kind of point of departure, but to, to just find the opening within the yes and the kind of all-encompassing sort of attitude that that might, might bring. Um, I just had a kind of um, thought about the stories. I think you... I mean, the, the kind of pitching of the book as a, as, a, as a graphic novel is really interesting as a mode of, of thinking about the work and trying to communicate the projects and work in a, in a completely different sort of medium, which I think is already saying yes to something that I think a lot of people would just not know how to react to because it's just such a difficult vehicle for an architectural kind of product. Um, but I also wonder, the stories are so interesting, or I think the stories could be kind of really interesting separate from the work itself, that if you, if you were to think of the stories as, in a way, architectural projects in and of themselves, to, to begin to um, use them not as tools to communicate the project, but just to, in a way, spend time on the, on the story itself and make it, in a way, its own, its own project? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually, I'm, uh, I, I am actually, because we, uh, I, I am specifically uh, working on a, on a project where the idea is to apply architectural thinking to storytelling. So like in a way, when you make an architectural project, you, you, you start with some kind of a conceptual framework that, that serves as a skeleton upon which you can then sort of uh, apply other sort of subplots within the main plot. And, uh, and gradually you can, in a kind of structured way, you can create something that ends up appearing completely sort of a, a fluid and continuous as almost like conceived in a single uh, moment, but in fact it has been built up by a kind of very conscious and very diagrammatic and very sort of strategic process. And, um, um, and, and, and I am in fact working on this sort of conspiracy theory uh, airport bestseller uh, uh, sort of uh, crime story uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a similar fashion. Um, but, uh, but, that's, uh, but that's also like to, to alleviate the fact that I don't know any architects that actually read architectural theory. Uh, maybe it's just, uh, <laughs> I know some architects that write it, but uh, <laughs> uh, so also maybe to try to see if there was a way to, because uh, I mean, I think it is quite relevant to talk about architecture and speculate on it and its limitations and its possibilities. And, and maybe if you could do it in the form of a, uh, of, of something more sexy than a, than a sort of a academic publication would be would be kind of interesting. Uh, I'm aware there's two more questions left on the floor. Come oh, on, maybe we should free. But, uh, like, uh, just uh, for, for the restless among us, there are there are wine around the corner. We'll have one last quick one last question, but then um, we'll move into an informal mode where you can accost Biaki and ask all the questions you want for the next half an hour. It's a really quick question. Your book is about yes, and I want to ask you if you have a job for me. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'd, 
love to see your portfolio. <laughs> Uh, all right, on that note, um, as, as I said at the start of the night, uh, just around the corner is um, uh, a free bar and Charlotte selling the books. But uh, please thank Biaki for a wonderful, entertaining evening. <laughs>